All right, hello everyone. This is Phil. Um, he is new to San Diego, and this is his first tour card. I'll let him take it away. All right, thank you. Um, good morning. Oh, nice. All right, so before I get started, um, I always have to cover this. Um, I'm not here representing my employer. Um, the other disclaimer that I don't put is um, I'm going to start shoveling information about mainframes at your brain. It's going to feel rough. Just come talk to me after the talk if you have questions. All right? Okay. I only got 25 minutes, so here we go. So, my name, so he introduced me as Phil. My name is uh, Soldier of Fortran on Twitter. Um, thank you. One fan. Nice. So I'm a, I'm a uh, mainframe hacker, so mainframe security researcher for a large bank. Um, I con contribute to a lot of open source projects, so I've contributed to KDE, Nmap, Metasploit, um, many more. Right, all my code is open source, stuff like that. Um, I've briefly been investigated by the Swedish secret police. Um, cool, not terrifying, not scary at all. Uh, and I'm a serial speaker, so I've, I spoke at uh, ShmooCon earlier this year about um, so that is a buffer overflow written in C that runs in Unix on a mainframe, written by a Swedish hacker, hence why I was under investigation, because uh, it wasn't me, and uh, that's all available online, feel free to watch it. I um, also gave a talk about, um, so mainframers like to post stuff on mailing lists, and so we took all the things they talked about for like, since like 1983, and we threw it all into a database, and I made a web interface so I can search for like, I wonder, I wonder what the TCP IP config for a bank looks like. <laughs> so fun, fun stuff. Oh, you, no one can see that. I wonder, can I zoom in? Let's see here. Let's see, oh, oh boy, this is gonna be hard to do. Who? Oh, here we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Oh, is that a California bank? Oh, dang. All right. I've also spoken at ShellCon. Who here saw my ShellCon talk? Like one, nice, one person, good. I'm not talking about any of that crap in this talk. I also teach a class called uh, Evil Mainframe where we teach all like mainframe pen testy type stuff. Um, it's a little intense. It's the only mainframe CTF in the world that we're aware of. So we actually found a person that teaches a class in Spain, but we're not, we're not sure about what's going on there. Anyways, I also run a program called The Imp which finds mainframe on the internet. Uh, sticker to the first person who can yell out the TLD for this mainframe. I, I, it's early, but come on. <laughs> dot mil. Who said dot? Someone over here said dot mil first. Definitely dot mil. Alrighty. And it's more scary to be up here talking than it is to do this. Anyways. So a little bit about mainframes. So who here has like touched a mainframe? like physically gone up and touched the fridge-sized <laughs> giant, because <laughs> it's the size of like a giant like commercial fridge. Um, who here, so, so who here knows how many mainframe vulnerabilities there are publicly listed on MITRE? Yeah, do you know how many? Zero. Wrong, it's two. Oh. <laughs> uh, the answer was, he tried zero. So it's, there's two exploits. And it was because the Swedish government forced IBM to release them publicly. Um, and the way they did it was stupid. Uh, they said, it's, it's not the mainframe OS, it's actually this other op application that, though we're pushing a kernel update. Right, so don't worry about it, don't worry. Anyways, I'm not gonna cover TSO. I've talked about TSO at length so many times. It's not even funny. You can watch any of those talks. They're all on YouTube. I'm not gonna talk about RACF. There's better talks I've given about RACF. Um, just know that RACF is the security database, right? So sort of like how like a, like a database or Oracle product might have a database, RACF is your security database and it says you have access to this, you don't have access to that. Uh, and memory, I'm not gonna talk about memory in this talk. I am gonna cover these things, I'm gonna cover data sets, kicks, JCL and you, so let's get started. So kicks, so data sets. These are what files are on the mainframe. You have 44 characters max, eight characters between the dots, that's it. The dots, it's not a hierarchical file system, it is a flat file system. So when you see like something dot something dot something, if I delete this file, the rest remain. They don't go away, they just stick around, it's flat. The same thing happens for, for rules. If I have a specific rule that says do not allow anyone access to tourcon.cool, 
but I don't have explicit rules. You can have generic rules, but if I have a specific rule and I don't have any rules that cover the other two, I can access those files. All right, that's data sets. So here we go, we delete the file, they stick around, because that's how the file system is. Now jobs, JC, the, the mainframe is a batch-driven operating system. So that means everything is done via batch. So JCL, um, you have to learn JCL to use a mainframe, and it looks like this. So it looks like garbage. The person who invented it says it's garbage. There's a whole talk at the Computer History Museum where he goes, it sucks. He doesn't even like it. But it's, it's basically, these are just like, like when you're writing like a bash script, that's all they are, right? You have standard in, standard out, all kinds of things. Um, every program you call has like flags and you just declare them in your JCL. It's not that much more, it's just different, right? It's not bad, it's just different. Okay, kicks, who here has used kicks? One person, two, three. Wrong, you've all used kicks. You just don't know. Who here has flown in a plane ever? <laughs> right, that is mostly driven by kicks-based interfaces, though you wouldn't know it. It has JSON, it has web-based interfaces, has all kinds of cool modern things, though you wouldn't know because everyone thinks it's all COBOL and old and like cobwebs and unusable. The reality is, like things like the Delta outage were caused because something couldn't talk to the Delta mainframe, not that the mainframe was down, okay? So it's made up, so when I talk about Kix, I usually, and mainframe or say this, I call it, it's like the first web app. It's like the first web app server. So basically you have this thing called a region, because this is before servers existed as a concept. So you have a region, a Kix region, and each region will have multiple transactions, which are like URLs. That's it, that's all, and it looks like this. It's not, it's Kix. All right, languages. It's got so many languages. It's got all of them. All the cool ones. Like, unlike Linux with Go and other garbage, it's got all the good ones. <laughs> and way more than that. Like, I'm not talking, like, RPG, PLI, there's all kinds of stuff, all right? Now, Unix. This is usually a part, so this whole, the rest of the talk's gonna be about Unix stuff and doing Unixy things, because I find that that's the gateway drug to mainframe hacking. So, it's Unix. It's literally just Unix. And the problem is it's just POSIX Unix doesn't come with Bash, doesn't come with any modern conveniences, it, ha it comes with Vi, but like the operating system just came out with an update this year, and Vi is still not interactive, like I'll delete a line, and then I gotta, ex like, I gotta do like a hit escape, hit a semicolon, and then it'll update the screen, okay? It's super old, but it works, um, and you can actually install Bash, but the version of Bash is still vulnerable to shell shock, so we don't do that. <laughs> but Unix powers the TCP IP stack, for the entire mainframe. That's what you need to know. As well, it's like literally just Unix. It's just Unix. So here's what's really cool. So the file system itself is actually just data sets that exist on the mainframe. But the mount command, so normally you do like mount and you'd show all the mount points. It doesn't work. But you can use DF to show the mount points. So when you run DF, it looks like this. So you get like a data set. This is important later when I'm talking about cool tools that we've all that we've released and new research. Alrighty, so real quick, slash hackers mounted to user.unix.h. That's the file that contains the file system that Unix uses. Everyone following along? All right. Okay, so first, one of the challenges is that there's no enumeration tools available for the mainframe, and I'm slowly working my way in eliminating that gap. One of them I just released literally last week is omvsenum.sh. It's based heavily on linenum and like Linux privilege suggester, exploit suggester sort of merged together. It works. Um, I was just testing on a system recently. It ran for six hours and it gave me a ton of information. It is loud. It will generate errors. It will generate access errors, but nobody's watching. <laughs> um, especially because no one's forwarding their, so Unix has its own syslog and no one forwards it to Splunk. Um, in, it, if you look up the Logica breach case, they are actually forwarding their syslog to temp. And then they, they had, oh, we got a hacker, and then they rebooted, and then they lost their logs. So, <laughs> it's, it's, but it's literally, it's meant to be familiar. It's supposed to look like linenum, so you can go through the data, and you can look at files, and then you can be like, what the heck is a plus A on a file? And you can dig up and what that means. Uh, NetEpsidicat, I rewrote in Python 3, so that it supports code pages. EpsidIC sucks. 
Um, and it's, it has like multiple international code pages. And if you get a reverse shell that's an EBCDIC, you need a way to talk to it. So I wrote net EBCDIC cat and then cat map three. So this is a really cool tool. It goes through and tells you every single data set on the system and your access to that data set. And I wrote it, and sometimes you get like a 400 meg file of just data sets and access rights. So I wrote it so it pipes it out to a shell. So here we go. So I'm gonna have a netcat listener running. Just a normal netcat, not EBCDIC netcat, just a regular netcat, because that's not a thing. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna call this program. You have to compile it. There's instructions on how to do that. I'm gonna run the program. It's gonna run. And I'm gonna see the entire, it's basically like a find space slash space exec space ls dash l on every single file. That's it. That's, that's how long it took. That's the entire file system and all my access rights to it. Okay, now remember, Unix is based on data sets, right? It's based on, so by default, when you run the mount command, it, there's certain permissions that have to be set and sometimes they're, normally they're set improperly because everyone ignores Unix in the mainframe space. Um, so if you can mount, if you type mount space a data set and it just mounts, then that means you can have set UID binaries in that data set ready for you to use to give you like a root ID or an APF authorized program. So if you can just mount a data set, you're good, you've owned the mainframe. If you can't mount the data set, but you can edit the mounted data sets you can just flip, it's just a vSAM file, and you can just go in and flip the permission bit at the actual file specifically, and then wait for the system to reboot, and now you have root shell. All right, that's Big Eddie and Smalls figure all this out, so kudos to him. Okay, let's talk about Java. Java's super cool, right? <laughs> Come on, it's early, I know, but all right. It's cool in the mainframe, though, so check this out. All right, so, comes, ZOS comes with a JVM. It runs in the Unix space. Everything that runs in JVM runs in Unix space. Tomcat runs. In fact, in the class that we teach, we have a vulnerable Apache Tomcat server, and you literally just type Metasploit doot, 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 and upload the WAR file, and it just works, right? Because it's, it's, it's easy. So the thing with Java that's important to know is it's free to run on the mainframe. So I got, come talk to me afterwards if you want to learn more about MIPS versus ZIPS. But just know it doesn't cost anything, so it's a good area for us to play. And we won't get caught for using resources. All right, so who thinks we can get a reverse shell using Java? You know, everyone, everyone, come on. All right, who thinks we can use an Android reverse shell <laughs> on our mainframe? Anybody? Anybody want to there? One, two, three. Okay, so we're going to upload it. I'm going to literally just change the IP and port. I'm going to upload it and compile it. And, and like, who think, okay, so what do you think? Think it's gonna work? Think it's gonna work? Like, I wouldn't be up here talking about it if it didn't work, right? Of course it works. <laughs> Except the only problem is it speaks EBCDIC, right? But that's fine. That's why I rewrote an EBCDIC cat. So here's the shell. Here's my shell prompt, right? So now that we know that, don't apologize. Don't, I literally took some person's code and ran it. <laughs> like, applaud this person. <laughs> like, all right. Because it gets, it gets better. So okay, so what, what, what else can we do with Java? So this is actually IBM's Java. And they add some extra stuff. They add uh, things called JZOS and JUtil. And there's some cool things we can use with that. So here, for example, this is all the code I need to flood your master console. I don't have time to talk about what the master console is. Just trust me. This is bad if I run this. If I compile it and then run it on my test box, I can flood the master console with TourCon. The master console is essentially where you control programs are running, I need to stop them, all kinds of cool and important stuff. It's also where all your security messages go. So if I'm doing nefarious things, I might just spam it with a whole bunch of stuff and then in the middle do what I'm trying to do. Um, funny story, Big Eddie and Smalls was messing around and doing the same thing in Assembler and then locked his machine because he couldn't, he couldn't kill the process because every time he looked up the process ID, um, his flood would fill the screen again. So he couldn't, and, and, then it just, and then it just got so full it killed the machine. All right. Now, one of the problems that I have when I'm on a mainframe is trying to find like an egress, a way to get my stuff off the mainframe. Like I'm stealing data, I'm stealing files. I need to find a way to get that stuff off the mainframe and onto my Linux box, okay? 
So I need to find egress ports that I can use. It's not just like, oh, here's all the, like, it's just all forwarding. Well, actually, sometimes they are, have no egress filtering, but hopefully you encounter the mainframe that does. So we use Java to, to find those ports. Now, you might be thinking, why aren't we using any of the other languages that are available to us that would be A, faster, and B, everyone else knows better, right? Well, the problem is you can't change the socket timeout on those connections. So I literally wrote a port scanner in Rex. And if, and if when you connect, some egress filtering just doesn't, doesn't send a reset, doesn't send anything, it just doesn't reply. It just sinkholes your, your SIN. And it just sits there for two and a half minutes waiting. Right? And so over 65,000 ports, that's a long time. However, in Java, so kudos to Sir Kixalot for figuring this out. There's a, like, it's not in the documentation, I looked. There, there's an old trick. If you use the socket.connect in Java, you can set a timeout in milliseconds. So what we do is we write a, this is available. So we, we run egress buster from trusted sec on a Linux box, on the web, on the corporate network, whatever. And then we run this, this Java program. We compile it and then we run it. And we don't care if egress buster sends like anything back. We, because what happens is when you connect to Egress Buster, it just tells you, I have a connection from that port, right? So we run the Java program blind, and we, have, we want the smallest timeout that we can set so that we can go through all 65,000 ports in literally a, like two minutes to find all the, all the ports that are available to us for Egress. And we've done this, like, so now that we can do this, we've successfully used this and been able to find, like, there's five ports open for us to use for Egress, right? And then I'll then some of them can go somewhere. Okay, now that we're able to find ports, we can do, the Java actually provides access to data sets. Now remember, Unix is just used for like a lot of TCP IP stuff, maybe some web servers. The actual data that you care about is gonna be in data sets in the, in the mainframe space. But that's fine, because Java provides methods to say, open this data set. You just provide it a data set name, and it opens it up. You can actually search for data set names using the catalog interface. It's all available. Um, and then you just take that and you just send it over the egress port. And if you know it's in EBCDIC, not binary, you can just translate it on the fly with Java. Now, can, so now that we know Kix is an application server, if we have access to Unix and really access to one Kix transaction, remember Kix transactions are four letters, if we have access to that and Unix, we can do privesk and become the Kix application server with Java. Okay, that's good. it's cool, yeah. So, we upload a jar. Actually, it's an OSGI, but for sake of argument. We upload it to just some folder in Unix somewhere, and then we run literally these three commands in Kix. I don't have much time. I don't have the time to go over all these commands in Kix, but basically it's you define the program, you define the transaction you're going to use. We're going to use JTM1, and then you define a bundle and that's the jar file that you just uploaded, right? So, so long as Kix has access to that folder somewhere in Unix, you can now execute this code. So then what you do is we're gonna set up a netcat listener, and then we're gonna connect into Kix. So we're gonna connect to Kix, and we're gonna access, now I wrote it to be kind of idiot proof, so I wrote it with like a, if you call it without anything, it shows you a usage and a cool ASCII logo, or I guess EBCDIC logo in this case. But so we're gonna, we're gonna run the JTM1 transaction that we just installed. And it gives you usage on the bottom on how to use this transaction. Now we're gonna run it, and now I have a shell. And I have a shell running as the Kix user. Now notice, I don't know, it goes by pretty quick. So notice my user ID in, in Unix now. Right? Thank you. There we go. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's like, I don't... What the hell just happened? <laughs> so, but this doesn't really mean anything. Okay, one, this is because the started task that's running Kix is running with a UID of zero. Right? Generally, that won't happen in a real application space, but because of the way Kix interacts with databases and stuff, if you can, act, if you can run a shell as or anything, like I'm just using a shell as an example because it's nice stunt hacking, 
But like, typically, like, realistically, I would write a bunch of DB2 interfaces and then have it run and then use that to access DB2 because that would be running as the Kix user and then I can access a whole bunch of database transactions. And guess what? There's a lot of stuff in Kix databases. Like, everything you care about is in a DB2 database or IMS driven by Kix. Like, everything you care about, student loans, your home mortgage, everything. Alrighty, so, but just because I have UID zero doesn't mean anything, I have to like do other things to do privesque in the Unix space to do stuff in, in the TSO world. But anyways, that'll get detected probably. So at this point, you're better off just staying as the application ID and just doing normal application-y things. But since I'm doing all this Java stuff, one of the things that, that perplexes me, there's actually no C2 client for the, for the mainframe. So I wrote one in Java for a very popular and simple C2 infrastructure. Um, I almost did this because A, no one's using this. B, it's easily detectable by any virus if you run the server. Um, and also, it was open source and easy for me to write for. So I wrote a Trevor C2 client in Java. So here you're gonna see, so I'm, I'm running Trevor C2. And I'm gonna interact, literally, it's already ran, like the Java ran already. So I'm gonna interact with my, my client and I have a valid shell prompt and everything in Trevor C2. All right, and I did that because I'm hoping someone will take that and then implement it in any other of the C2 actual p that people use. But, and this, I'm actually just waiting for them to accept my pull request. So I think with that, first I wanna say thank you for having me out here. This is my first tour con, it's been awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and, and with the two minutes that I have left, the timer's up here. Uh, are there, there's one question already. Um, do, you want, do you want me to run the mic? Oh, we got three minutes. Oh, any questions? Yeah, you want to yell it out? Yeah, for the OMBS uh, privilege enumeration scripts, uh, does it account if it's uh, not using the conditions to find the OMBS or the HFS? Yeah. So, so the question was. Um, so the permissions in, in Linux are actually at the file, in Unix, are at the file system level. Yeah, but sometimes they don't find them there. Right. So it's not, it's not, it's literally just using Unix commands. So it's not, so if, if so when, so when you're accessing a file, even though the, the permissions are set outside in like ACF2 perhaps, it's still going to show up as your access rights within. I know, I know what you mean, but it doesn't do that because it's just a Unix tool, right? Like I can't. We could do some checking, but that once you start doing like ESM commands, you start getting like really noisy because you generally don't have. Anyway, the, everyone else has no idea what we're talking about. But come talk to me afterwards because I want I want to pick your brain. Another question. Uh, preferred My preferred emulator, um, I would say probably SNES 9x, but that's a. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Someone got my mainframe joke. Um, it's act, it's act, I use uh, X3270. Um, in fact, I just wrote a Python script that'll take whatever awesome color scheme you have for, for Bash or like your, your terminal emulator, and it'll convert it to an awesome theme for X3270. But uh, yeah, you have to use a 3270 emulator for everything you do in, um, in, in ZOS, like when you're connecting to like TSO and stuff. Uh, any other questions? No, everyone's an expert on mainframes now, cool. And no one has any questions about the mainframe the most s systemically important platform on the planet. No one cares. Good? <laughs> we good? All right, well thanks again everyone. I wanna say thank you for having me. If anyone has any further questions, Phil will be outside. <laughs>